Thanks for joining us. This is We've Got Issues, and I'm Nancy Furness. So today we're filming on site at Coquitlam City Centre Library, and we'd like to thank the library for allowing us this venue to hold our interviews. Also like to thank Tri-Cities Community Television for uh, doing the filming. Before we get started, I'd just like to acknowledge that our interviews do take place on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded lands of Coquitlam First Nation. So we thank the Coquitlam people who continue to live on these lands and to care for the lands and the waters and all that lie above and below. So today we're joined with Jennifer Blatherwick, who is the NDP um, candidate for MLA for Coquitlam Millardville. So thanks so much for joining us today, Jennifer. Thank you for having me, Nancy. Always a pleasure. Well, we've spoken a few times, but in the past when we've spoken, um, it's been as your role as a school trustee for School District 43 and all the wonderful work that you've done there. Can you maybe tell us a little bit about why you decided to make the jump from school trustee into provincial politics? Yes, thank you. Uh, this was a decision that I had to make together, as we were talking before, mm. uh, that I had to make together with my family uh, because it is a big shift. But one of the things that you encounter when you have the honor of being a school trustee is that people talk to you about their lives and you discover that almost all of the issues that face them are systemic. So affordable housing, making sure there's great public education, good quality health care, all of those things happen at a provincial level. And so for me, it was hearing those stories, knowing my own family story, it was a natural transition to looking towards provincial systems to try and help with some of the challenges we face. Well, thank you. I think that's really interesting that you've put your experience and what you've heard um, as a school trustee and taken it to a, high, a different level. Um, I know that you're in the community a lot. We see you around at many events and you're involved in a lot of different things at the community level and within the riding that you're running in now. Can you tell us a little bit about some of those volunteer um, experiences and some of the groups that you're involved with? Well, some of the opportunities I've had that have been really impactful in my choices have actually been much smaller volunteer opportunities, uh, the little jobs that actually make work happen. Mm. So I was very lucky to volunteer with People's Pantry and Immigrant Link Services Society in helping with their food recovery systems because food security is a huge issue across right, the Tri-Cities. affects all of us. Yeah. yeah, and that certainly led me to my participation in um, food, larger food systems. So working together with uh, the United Way's Food Hub um, as, as organizations to come together to try and solve uh, food security problems in the Tri-Cities. Uh, but again, you know, volunteering with Access Youth, uh, which is an organization where I was the executive director for almost two years. Um, I started volunteering there, and you see the challenges that youth uh, are facing in the community, uh, and you realize that they're all connected um, to issues of affordability mm -hmm. and equity. Uh, so that piece uh, has been very big and has led me to lots of other tables where the main goal is trying to pull everyone together to use the resources we have. So the Homelessness and Housing Task Force, which has been a big piece of making sure that there's an emergency weather shelter in the heat and the cold. Uh, working together on the Tri-Cities uh, Community Action Team on the drug poisoning crisis. That has been a great conversation place and a place of action for uh, nonprofits, community members, uh, parents who have lost their children uh, governmental bodies to come together to try and figure out how we stop that crisis happening in the Tri-Cities. And I was able to be involved in the Tri-Cities Pride Society, which just had its first really successful uh, Quitlam Pride this last, um, this last couple of months. And uh, for me, also childcare. So I was able to be the chair of the Tri-Cities Task Force on Childcare and bringing together the municipalities, the school districts, um, some representatives from the Coquitlam Nation, all of us working together were able to give recommendations to the provincial government and actually shift actual legislation to make it easier, better, and more affordable for childcare to exist within the school framework. So I can talk a lot about this, but the main takeaway point is you have to work together with the people that are in your community to find solutions that fit your community. Well, you know, I think all the work you've done and, and you've um, made the point that a lot of this is systemic and that there are some big changes that need to be made. And maybe this is not a fair question, but 
Out of all those issues that you've seen and understanding that they're all interconnected, what is the one main issue that you see or the maybe the biggest issue that you see for the um, Tri-Cities or for Coquitlam Millardville? That is a great I know, question. It's, sorry, it's a and, and you're right, like it is very difficult to point at one thing because all you pull on one thread and the mm -hmm. whole weave moves around. Uh, affordability uh, would be an underlying issue, and right. a big piece of that. And it affects so many other things, Yes, right? has been housing. Uh, housing, housing, housing. And we've seen some really fantastic developments and investments in Coquitlam. Uh, I, I could not be happier with the provincial government's choice to support the co-ops that are in our community, right. um, to continue to thrive and to support people in their long-term affordable housing solutions. But there's also been some great partnerships uh, closer to my end of the city in Millardville. So I'm thinking specifically of like the Como Lake United Church, which was able to work together with government and industry to build, rebuild their church on the bottom of the building and then have affordable housing. On and we're top. seeing some of these partnerships mm -hmm. emerging now. Yeah, I would really like to continue to pursue those solutions, okay. partially because anyone who lives in the Tri-Cities knows that the most expensive thing about building a house, about building a building, about building a business, is not the building, yes. it's the land it sits Getting on. Getting the property. Yeah. yeah, and so the few places that still have land that can be converted to other purposes, mm -hmm. we need to figure out how that serves the entire community. And uh, there's provincial government land, municipal land, federal government land that exists here, mm -hmm. as well as uh, belonging to you know other organizations. I think us working together, figure out how to serve everyone is a great solution. You know, you bring some innovative thoughts and ideas, new ideas. As a new MLA, taking those ideas um, to the province and to Victoria, how how do you um, envision being heard? Like, how will you make sure that your voice is heard as a new MLA? I, oh, this is such a great question because it's another one that hits at the heart of many different concerns, right? Uh, one of them is being a woman, right? Uh, being a True, woman yes. representative, yes. that can be challenging. Uh, you have to... Uh, accept that there's going to be resistance and not necessarily from your colleagues but also from um, and not even within your community uh, some of the grumpiest emails I receive are from the United States uh, oh that's <laughs> interesting I know yeah. um, but persistence is the key right uh, you have to if I am lucky in anything it's that I have the Finn Donnelly persistence model to right. like sort of base on you've got a mentor uh, right <laughs> Uh, Finn has been uh, working to bring issues mm -hmm. to the attention of the national and provincial stage that other people didn't necessarily care about. Mm -hmm. um, okay. And uh, or Benita, I would say, is another yes. great yes. example. Benita Zerillo, a strong he, voice. Yeah. Uh, was anyone talking about dental care uh, before Benita? I, there definitely were people talking about dental care, but at the governmental federal level, right. did we think five years ago we were going to see a dental care plan? that gave free dental to children under 12. And now it's come to seniors. fruition, I, some of it, yes. So exciting. Uh, yeah, and, it is. But the Finn Donnelly model has really worked for us specifically in Coquitlam because Finn is a persistent, determined collaborator. So mm -hmm. when he knew that his community really wanted the Burke Mountain School, yes. Finn continued to call and advocate and call and advocate. I swear, probably everyone else in the government would like duck when they saw him. <laughs> no, it's not Finn again. Right? But he persisted. <laughs> oh, and it's a tenacity. Yes, uh, but not in a confrontational yes. way, not in a way that was going to make people turn away. It was a way that made people want to turn in. Right. And I think that's the solution, right? Is you continue to work with the people because we are so lucky here in Coquitlam. Every level of government is committed to working for the community. So every level of government wants to find solutions. They may not necessarily agree with you on what those solutions are, but if you have that common ground of mm. let's fix this problem, then you can go forward. Well, and I think sometimes it's helping not to all be, yes. not to get instant consensus on everything. You need to have that sort of fertile ground of um, mm. looking at ideas and mixing up ideas. You're talking about all levels of government being involved. You're talking about building schools on Burke Mountain. Yeah. Um, one thing that it kind of is leading me towards is the whole housing issue. Mm -hmm. Now, the BCNDP government has recently implemented some uh, provincial housing legislation. Yes. So um, sort of putting a mandatory um, minimum density requirements mm -hmm. in any community over 5,000. Yeah. Um, are they on the right track of 
with maybe addressing the affordable housing crisis? Uh, well, we've talked about some of the amazing uh, mm -hmm. developments that have happened here that have put real, real places into communities for real families. Right. But it would be disingenuous of me to say that every community, every municipality is happy with the legislation that's come in. Yes. And Coquitlam, I think, deserves a lot of praise for how hard it worked to make sure that uh, every opportunity they could, they were trying to get affordable housing and not just like blanket affordable housing, but adapted to people with disabilities, adapted to seniors, adapted to, they really worked hard on it. And so if we want to go forward and be successful and get buy-in from everyone, we really need to listen to our partners like the city of mm -hmm. Coquitlam, who have been doing the work on the ground for like this last decade, um, and we're doing it really effectively. Yes. So uh, I think after the election, um, before the election, during the election, it's time to continue to talk about this topic. And, and to me, I really believe that you must take action and then you must take reflection. Right. So when you do something, you have to make choices and you have to go forward. But then you listen to the people who are most concerned. And when they tell you, this is how you can improve, you say, thank you for your suggestion. Let's figure out how we can make what we've done better. You know, I just want to thank you for your pragmatic approach and, you know, to be open. I'm a mom. I have five children. You've had lots of experience. <laughs> you have to be pragmatic about everything. <laughs> but to say that reflection piece, because yeah. that is so important to listen to the communities and to have that sort of yeah. opportunity to maybe adjust and adapt. And I agree, Coquitlam has done some amazing work as yeah. far as community planning and neighborhood planning, and, um, and they deserve to be listened to. So thank you mm -hmm. for, for sharing that. Another area, so I'm going to, I'm, and I say in advance, I'm going to, we're going to cover are great a questions. lot of areas. These are great questions. We could probably do a whole entire interview on one. We could totally go into depth and we could spend a whole day talking about this easily. But one area that you've been really active and really vocal in is the toxic drug crisis or the poisonous drug crisis. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's been an evolution. We used to call it like the overdose crisis or opioid crisis. Can you talk about what your involvement has been in the Tri-Cities with respect to the toxic drug crisis? Uh, thank you. So my uh, involvement uh, predates my becoming executive director for Access Youth. Um, but the goal of working together um, in the Tri-Cities is to, one, educate people mm -hmm. uh, and to make change in policy in our environment that will actually reduce the number of people who are both involved in a relationship with a substance, right. but encourage them also to get treatment. So when we, I, sorry, I'm just going to stop you for a second. Yeah. When you say educate people, mm -hmm. who are we educating and what are we educating them about? Well, you know, I am in education, in public education, K-12, so my instinct is always kids, right? K-12, to you know, how do we let them know with science-backed, realistic, truthful conversations that are respectful of them that these drugs are out there, they're unsafe, and you need to be making choices that keep you safe. Right, okay. But we also need to be continuing to talk to parents and adults in the community because we need to make sure that when kids get into trouble, they mm -hmm. have a safe, trusted adult to go to. They're able to go to somebody and say, yes. I'm in trouble. It is so yeah. tempting as a parent and adult to just be like, no. Yes. Right? Yes. And just, I just told you that and that's it. But we have to continue to learn ourselves mm -hmm. uh, because our children need to know that when something wrong happens, that they can trust us to help them solve the problem, not to punish them for being honest about the problem. Yes. So... If I had anything that in my mind that I would like us to do differently, um, one would be to recognize that the fentanyl drug crisis is different than what has come before because of the level of physical addiction that happens with fentanyl. Uh, there is a requirement, we need more medical detransition beds to support mm -hmm. people in um, weaning themselves off the immediate effects of detox from uh, fentanyl. And we need more responsive treatment outside of downtown Vancouver. So, okay, yeah, I, I there are so definitely the really, crisis isn't just no focused on Vancouver. It's happening in the tri. One hundred percent. And and I I think that thirty thirty Gordon has come up a lot in the last yes, while it has. Um, because people see people using drugs there mm -hmm. and they see the effects of it. But the vast number of people who are using opioids in the Tri-City that are using substances to manage pain, to manage illness, are not people living at 3030 Gordon. 
Right. The overwhelming majority of people that have passed away from the fentanyl drug crisis in Coquitlam have been men 45 and over who used to work in the construction industry. So they're so. a physical mm -hmm. pain? So they're often, sometimes? they were injured uh, in some kind of uh, workplace situation or outside of workplace, but they, they dealt with pain. Some of them started on their uh, relationship with opioids because they were prescribed. Right. And then when all the knowledge came out about how addictive opioids were, uh, then there was a reflexive pulling back of prescription of opioid uh, for pain management. Leaving those people stranded, stranded, but still struggling with the pain. Yes. And that part wasn't managed. And often, as you know, um, as, as everyone knows, um, uh, men often struggle to reach out for help. Mm -hmm. And especially um, that is, is dangerous because it's a mental health crisis and a yes. physical health crisis. And when those two things come together, so the people that are, that are dying, that are in a relationship with substances, are people that have jobs and families mm -hmm. and lives. Sort of a silent, hidden crisis yes. beyond what we're seeing. Yeah, and, and, who are, uh, and because fentanyl contamination is uh, so easy, um, because fentanyl comes, uh, is a very powerful drug, comes in like tiny, tiny, tiny right. micro doses, and a, even a slight um, change in the content of fentanyl and drug can take you from an experience that you're used to to an overdose right. that you can't recover from on your own. And we're definitely seeing more um, drugs that are contaminating the supply. So carfentanil, which is even, you know, even more powerful than fentanyl. Um, benzodiazepines, which are counteracting the action of the naloxone that is, mm -hmm. is, a, is a solution to overdose. Um, xylazine, which is another contaminant that causes uh, like health effects all through the yes. body. So. Uh, we really need to continue to educate the kids, educate adults. There are some great uh, nonprofits out there doing this work. Access Youth has been doing it, uh, the Tri City uh, Community Action Team on the Drug Poisoning mm -hmm. Crisis, but also industry partnerships like Toolgate, Tailgate Toolkit uh, right. have been working on this to try and reach the people that are most affected. So, Jennifer, thank you for that. That was a really <laughs> comprehensive answer, and I think I would love to have you come back and just maybe focus on some of these issues because you have so much insight and so much information and, and sort of wisdom to share there. Um, we're going to just keep plowing through all these um, different sort of aspects because I think you do have lots of information to share out there. I want to talk a little bit about climate change and our environment. Now, mm -hmm. we've seen an unprecedented heat dome. We've seen, you know, increasing temperatures every year, record-breaking temperatures. We see wildfires and we struggle with the smoke from those. Can you tell me what um, people who are concerned about the environment, why would you be a good candidate and why, would, why should they send you to Victoria? Well, thank you. I think the first thing I want to talk about is that often we hear about cost. Mm -hmm. The most costly choice is to do nothing. Yes. Right? And we're seeing uh, that now. Yeah. Uh, it, it is the most costly yeah. choice is to pretend that nothing is happening. Yes. So even if you uh, do not feel that climate change is a human-caused phenomenon, mm -hmm. uh, I would strongly disagree with that, but um, you, you know, you physically know that summers are warmer than they were when you were a kid. There's less snow, then there's less rain. Um, we're experiencing the effects of unprecedented temperatures across the globe. Every summer. We so summer. humans have developed our industry, have developed our social systems, have developed our way of life um, to fit in a climate uh, mm -hmm. that existed 30, 40 years ago. And if we want to successfully continue living on this planet in the, in the comfort that we do now, we have to figure out how to counteract this trend. Mm -hmm. So the most, there is no way for me to say, I'm not a climate scientist and uh, I'm not an expert on um, climate sequestration or any of those things. The most important job I have as a policymaker is to listen to the people that are. Right. right? Okay, to listen to the experts. Yeah, it is. Uh, and that's uh, sometimes harder <laughs> than it seems in politics. Um, but you must, because this is an investment of resources in the prevention of a disaster. Mm -hmm. And we've seen it over this last while. Um, but it's not just listening to you know, new science, it's also listening to old wisdom. So one of the things that the province has been doing 
is working together with Indigenous peoples to talk about cultural uh, burning and prescribed burning to prevent right. forest fires. And, and their traditional practice of burning was a great <laughs> maintenance way to prevent large-scale forest fires. And then and we lost that wisdom. They knew how to steward the lands. Right? Yeah, and now we're yeah. coming back to that okay. wisdom. Uh, I'd like to see more of those partnerships. Uh, we also have to recognize that um, people pay attention to climate change issues when they are not worried about putting food on the table. And, and we need to be making sure that people can do both at the same time. Right. And I think you just bring up a really good point again about how everything is interconnected because with climate change, our, our you know, increasingly hot summers, droughty summers, we're seeing how it's affecting food security. Yes. And like there's so many interconnected parts. And now you've just brought up elements of reconciliation um, and listening to Indigenous wisdom. Can we talk, I know we could talk all day about climate yes. issues as well, yep. but could we talk a little bit about reconciliation because you brought it up. Yes, <laughs> I, and I'm happy to bring it up. Um, I think that I'm very proud that British Columbia is the first jurisdiction in North America to sign under it. That yes. was huge, so making a commitment. Um, can you tell us what yes. UNDRIP, just very quickly, uh, the, like your, what that commitment is, what uh, that means? Yeah, and uh, so UNDRIP is the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, uh, and it is a framework for how um, governments that have more control and more power can deal respectfully with people who are indigenous to the land. Mm -hmm. So for us, um, that is First Nations, uh, Indigenous, and Métis, Inuit people. Uh, mostly here in British Columbia, um, we have a different framework than some of the other places in Canada because we didn't have um, a lot of treaty agreements in place. So right now, uh, treaty agreements are both moving through negotiation and there's also court processes in place. Uh, I think British Columbia has done uh, well in moving forward with negotiated settlements because those are the ones that are going to bring us into a place where we're working together. Right. Uh, recognizing the truth of, um, the truth before reconciliation. Yes. Right? yes. Um, so not though just the things that happened in the past, like the 60s scoop and the residential schools, but and also- that it's still happening to some extent. Yes. Foster care. Uh, foster care, but also in, um, in all of our social systems. Mm -hmm. uh, we all remember the incident where the grandpa took his granddaughter to the bank and then the police were called, right? Uh, is that we, as adults living in this society, we have to take responsibility for making sure that our children have, are further along in the reconciliation journey. So by the time my children become full adults participating in society, I would like to be able to say we are further along in developing a respectful relationship. And all of the systems that we have. Um, now I am a bit of a data person. Um, and one of the things that, um, uh, say the First Nations uh, Education Council has asked of us at, uh, in education is to do better at mm -hmm. keeping track of how people are doing. Uh, the Human Rights Commissioner brought forward uh, a report on collecting data and how the government can work together with Indigenous peoples mm -hmm. and it discussed the grandmother perspective is that we only connect collect data for the purpose of better understanding how to help people, um, not understanding um, how, how they are flawed in some way, but how the system can do better right. to support them. So it's not looking at individuals, it's looking at a collective improvement, yes. ways to improve. Uh, so we're kind of trying to shift here in the province from looking at uh, collecting data to judge people, right? but shifting to data that we collect to judge the system. Right. And uh, that's something that I've been really proud of the school district. That's a whole quality yeah. shift in right? quality there. So it's, it's, it's enormous. And mm -hmm. uh, we're really seeing the results here in Coatum School District by collecting data from families where they tell us how we are doing and how we can better support them. Right. And I am so What proud. an innovative right? approach. <laughs> like, how can, how can we help you? And watching the great uh, the graduation rates of yes. Indigenous students rise. Yeah. So there's still more to do. There's mm -hmm. always more to do. Um, and we could probably have a whole other discussion about uh, the social work system. We could. Yeah, and the justice system. Uh, but uh, I think we also need to celebrate the successes yeah. that happen. Well, and, and I'm actually just going to make one more point is that I've talked about the systems, but the most important part is the choices of the people. Right. So 
the indigenous families and students who have done the work because the school district just gave them supports mm -hmm. to do it themselves. Yes, yes. Yeah. So they're, they're the ones whose success stories we need to be celebrating um, and then listening so we can do better. In the awesome. And then I think also another component in there is when you're talking about education is that now um, talking about residential schools and talking about the truth part of it yeah. is actually part of the curriculum. Yes. yes. And that, you know, now we can no longer say, I didn't know, I, I never heard about any yes. of this before. So it's moving together. Um, yes. forward to a better place as well. Yeah, so before uh, students learn about um, the full history, uh, students learn about the full history of British Columbia uh, all the way along their educational journey in age-appropriate ways, mm -hmm. uh, but they do have to have an Indigenous education graduation credit mm -hmm. in order to graduate. Uh, and that, I want to give all credit to uh, Melanie Mark, uh, who, yeah, who was a fierce advocate yes for um, bringing more uh, thoughtful education into the BC public system was uh, a critic, but only in order to make it better. Right, and, right. and the work that she did uh, has changed uh, the perspective of um, education across British right. Columbia. Okay, now our time is rapidly coming to an end, but I have one more tough question for you. Sure. Um, so. BC's health or Canada's healthcare system, mm -hmm. I guess, is the envy of countries around the world. But we constantly hear that BC's health care system is in crisis. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about that? What you'd like to see done? What's being done? Mm -hmm. um, and just give us a, a sense of what's happening there and yeah. what you would like to see as an MLA. Um, should you yes, get there? Yes, thank you. Yeah. Um, so. First, I think we need to recognize that shortage of staffing in healthcare is a global problem. Mm -hmm. uh, that is a uh, thing that all of us, all of our neighbors, all of our partners, we're all struggling with. Uh, but one of the changes that's been made here in British Columbia that's uh, helped us is retaining the family doctors we already have. Okay. And the big change that was made, I think it's almost 18 months ago now, was uh, upping the rates that we were, the basic rates we were paying family doctors. Right. Yeah, right. so uh, both my husband's parents are uh, retired family doctors and they will tell me stories of when they were practicing and they would make a phone call to consult with a patient and they were allowed to bill one dollar for that phone call, oh, right? Wow. So not in any way sustainable. Right. And there had been a long period of time where the rates were static and it didn't reflect uh, what we all know, our, mm -hmm. our mutual experience here in the Tri-Cities is that the cost of maintaining a space was going up and up yes. and up and up. So we were, by not upping the rates to match what was happening in the community, we were So our doctors are falling further They were further driving behind. family doctors mm -hmm. um, out of their ability to practice. So right. upping the rates has slowed uh, the rate that family doctors were leaving practice. So keeping the ones we already have is huge. Right. Um, making sure that we're recruiting uh, extensively as far as we can is really good. I. This last year, we've hired 700 new family doctors to come into British Columbia. Wow. Yeah, and especially uh, there's areas in the province where um, family doctors are at an especially high premium, like rural communities. Are there incentives offered to have family doctors move to rural areas? Uh, no, that's a really good question. Um, right now, one of the things that happens is uh, the cost of living in Vancouver is so high that it makes it difficult for uh, doctors right. and any medical professional to transition to our province. So there are areas in the province like Kamloops and Kelowna that are more attractive to people who are coming from other areas just because of the cost housing of housing and cost of living. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Uh, but we also need to make sure that we're continuing to pursue um, the internationally trained physicians and making sure mm -hmm. that their accreditation can come through, not just the physicians, but medical professionals, period. So you're talking nurses, nurses and technicians and all of the jobs. Uh, there needs to be more um, available uh, internship spaces so that when right. they come in, their, all their training is complete. All they need is six more months to practice with Canadian physician. We need to make sure there's more spaces. Right. So there's ways yes. to make it happen. Yeah. And some of those are in and progress And training already. new doctors. So mm -hmm. we just had the announcement a short while ago that there's going to be a new medical school uh, in Surrey the first in Western Canada. That's I'm 55 so. years. Yeah. That's pretty exciting. So keeping the doctors we have, um, bringing more doctors from elsewhere, and then growing up new doctors are really, really good solutions. And ultimately in our community, 
what I'd like to see is more efficiency of practice. Right. So uh, one of the solutions is to do health hubs where you have family doctors and specialists practicing together. Okay. And patients can come in. Uh, that model has been used very successfully in the foundry, which is oh. the foundries are um, uh, physical and also virtual yes. across the province. Uh, there's one in Maple Ridge right now, and the Tri-Cities have been approved for one. Now, they focus on youth and their families, but they mean that uh, youth can come in uh, or virtually online or on the phone can connect with the foundry, and they can be shepherded through getting medical and mental health support services wow. without those barriers of needing right. uh, to go to a family doctor physically and get a referral. When you're looking at mental health. Yeah. Um, you don't want barriers there. That's the last yes. thing you want to put into place. Yes, because people are often already tired from yes. um, battling and struggling with their mental health. What you need is a streamlined system that can get them to the help they need as soon as possible. Jennifer, I want to thank you so much for coming in, and I feel like we could have talked all day, but um, you know, thank you for sharing all those thoughts and everything, and we'll wish you all the very best in your run for MLA for the coquitlam Millardville area. Thank you, Nancy. It's always a great pleasure to come here and talk to you, uh, and next time we'll just do one issue. We will do one issue. So thanks yeah. again, Jennifer. Really appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedule and coming in today, and we'll wish you all the very best in your run for MLA for the coquitlam Millardville riding. Thank you. Thanks so much for joining us this afternoon. I'm Nancy Furness. This is We've Got Issues, and we've been speaking with Jennifer Blatherwick, who is taking a run for the NDP MLA seat in Coquitlam-Millardville.